Uh, well, hi, and thank you for coming. Welcome to another of uh, CBI of Chicago's Best Ideas. And I think I'll just uh, jump right into the, uh, uh, to the talk. Uh, I will try to leave uh, plenty of time for questions, maybe even some answers, so you could um, jot them down or bear them in mind. And, um, well, well, I have something to say about that, but we'll see where we are when we get to that. So um, here's uh, what my topic is about. Uh, it's about moving step by step, uh, about so-called incrementalism. And uh, here's where I'll begin. I, I figure at least 20 seconds to justify the title might be uh, a good idea. So what's the right drinking age? Like, why don't we let 17-year-olds drink? There's a very optimistic answer and then another very optimistic answer. And I want to start off right away with I'm in door number two. I'm going to be really optimistic, but it's not for the first reason, it's for the second reason. The most optimistic thing would be we're really great at this. We study costs and benefits and risks. We figure out how you learn to drive. We figure out who's a good driver. We sort of think it might not be a good idea to have eight-year-olds drive. We could do some experiments and see that they're wild and drunk all the time or whatever it is. And then we do a thing on 35-year-olds and we decide that they're the best drivers we have. And the returns to them in terms of getting jobs and being happy or whatever it is is really great. And, you know, then we start working our way. And we realize we want to take some old people off the road, and we figure that out too. But just focusing on the minimum age. And we work our way, and then we might decide, you know, how do we feel about 22-year-olds, 21-year-olds, why all this, that. And then we come up with some answer. That would be like the cost, benefit, efficiency, old-fashioned Chicago way to decide uh, driving ages. I, I'm not that optimistic. That seems ridiculous uh, to all of us, right? First of all, it doesn't seem to be how we do find driving ages. Second of all, it's very, very hard uh, to do that, right? It's the short, shortcoming of uh, cost-benefit analysis because uh, how do you know, you know, how are we going to measure the pleasure that 23-year-olds get from driving? I mean, it's very, very hard to figure out what driving is worth to you. We could try to auction it off, but auctioning it off is a very hard uh, th could you raise your hand if there's an empty seat next to you? Wait, Lisa, stand up. Raise your hand, empty seat. Come, please. If only they were students, I could now say my favorite. And that's all they'll be on the final exam. Just to, you know, there we go. Do you want half a lunch? No, I'm fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, so we could do this optimistic way. It's very, very hard to do it. I don't think it can be done. All right, what's the next optimistic way uh, to do it? The next optimistic way to say it has really nothing to do with the right driving age directly. It has to do with the battle of interest groups. And this is where I want to go. And let's do the optimistic story. Well, you know, it's not that 21-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds, they battle about what the right age to drive is, what the right age to drink is, what the right age to vote is. Right? There are a lot of things where we have minimum age uh, legislation. If you just focus on drinking, by the way, you know, if you think it's hard, I, I said driving before, think about how hard it is to figure out how much you like to drive. It's really, really hard to get people's information about how much they like to drink because people don't usually know their pleasure of drinking until they drink and, and so forth. It might be with driving, we could give you one month of driving lessons and then say, how much would you pay to be able to drive at this age? Very, very hard to do that for voting, drinking, and other things. So all those things, I think it's a mess. Second method is do the interest group effect. Uh, you know, start out saying uh, 25 year olds, you know, we're thinking of making the minimum age for drinking 26. Do you want to drive? And the 25 year olds might get together. Thanks. You want a seat? Right here. Come. You're welcome. You want a seat? Right there. Okay. Do you want a seat? You can't have one. Yeah. <clears throat> Could you raise your hand if there's a seat next to you one more time? Here, Maureen, look, watch. Seats are being offered. All right, now I'm going to go without stopping while you chew. All right, what's the interest group effect? Well, maybe the 25-year-olds battle. They want to drink. They want to drive. They want to vote. They want to do whatever. Well, first of all, age cohorts are not really good at lobbying. Uh, you know, by the time you lobby and change your mind, you know, by the time you lobby and change the mind of the body politic, it's too late for you already, right? This is like why law students have no power in the world, right? Like, why doesn't the federal government give subsidies to law students? 
well, you know, you get some LSA president that's really interested in it, and then they go to Washington and they argue, and by the time they get their way, it's, you know, 10 years later and a whole different set of people in law school. So it's not worth, you know, no interest group really finds it worthwhile to get benefits of this kind. Same with an age cohort. You know, current 18-year-olds are just not very good at organizing about things for 18-year-olds. Now, it might be, for most things, we have proxy groups. So it might, who's a good proxy group for drinking? Uh, who's a good proxy group for driving? Well, mothers against, ma mothers against drunk driving, is that what they're called? Yeah, mad. Uh, they hate uh, drinking. They hate driving. They hate both, <laughs> especially when the two go together. Uh, McDonald's, for example, really likes lower driving ages, just to pick things like that, right? McDonald's is a pretty good proxy for people who want to be able to drive cars at age 15. That would be a really good thing for McDonald's to get more people driving. Those people could be on the workforce at McDonald's. They would come buy burgers and, you know, whatever else it is that McDonald's sells. Well, who's a good proxy for drinking at a younger age? You know, I guess bars. I mean, bars are not single-age cohorts. It's very rare to have a bar that says only 21-year-olds allowed, meaning no 22, no 20, no 23. You know, we just service one age group. Most, some people, not at your age yet, but some people tend to have friends who are different ages from themselves. It can be done, I, I assure you. And so there isn't really that good an interest group in favor of lowering the drinking age, but not bad. You know, bartenders and restaurants, would, uh, certainly liquor makers, they like lowering the age. So that's the way I want to think about it, that MAD is out there trying to raise the drinking age, and the bartenders, so to speak, their trade association is out there trying to lower the drinking age, and then it's a battle. It's a political battle, and in the optimistic world, we have matched interest groups. They're equally hard or easy to organize. They battle against each other. They produce law. That's what we call law, right? Everything in our legal system, you might say, especially in the legislature, comes from a battle between interest groups, and if you want to hope that power politics, which is what I'll call that, if you want to hope that power politics produces a good world, or an efficient world, or a just world, or whatever it is you're after, I think the way you have to think about it is that you have to hope that that quasi-market works. That is, that pretty well-matched interest groups ballot out. To some extent, they're influenced by the amount of money people will give them or spend on their products, which might be some measure of how much people want to drink, or how much safety people on or whatever it is, and they just have to hope that that works out and we get where we are. So my starting point is that the, what's the right drinking age? Whatever drinking age we have. That's the optimistic view. Because whatever we have is a political battle between groups in a world where people can observe traffic accidents and drinking and crazy behavior while drinking and all that and the pleasures of drinking. And we just have to hope, just like with the rest of our legal system, that when these interest groups battle each other, they reach an OK social equilibrium. So I'm going to be optimistic, and I'm going to assume that's optimum. And now what I want to show is that even if you're that optimistic, wow, those things really make a lot of noise, those popping things. All right, it could be like the theater where you, um, they say, could you open your wrappers now, and then everybody laughs. Is the noise coming from opening them or closing them? OK, if you want to close yours, could you close it now? And if you don't close it, then don't close it later. <laughs> All right, I'm going to count to three, and then we're going to stop closing them. One, two, three. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> See that? And who said there's a collective action problem? You see that? I mean, everybody <laughs> obeys. So, OK. So that's my social optimum. All right, now let's move forward to other problems. And I want to show you that even if you want to be that optimistic, you can't be that optimistic about law in other uh, areas. Um, Maybe even before doing that, I should say, you notice when we raise drinking ages, like say it goes from, you know, I don't know what you remember. Anybody rem I remember it going from 18 to 19, 19 to 20, 20 to 21. It was done in staggered shifts. Say when the drinking age goes from 19 to 20, and you go back and you read newspapers at the time. Nobody said, uh-oh, slippery slope. They're raising the drinking age to 20. Just wait. It's going to be 45 before you know it. And part of what this talk is about is, well, why is that? That is, why in some things do we think there's a slippery slope? You notice a slippery slope there would make a lot of sense. It goes from 19 to 20, goes from 20 to 21. Let's raise it from 21 to 22. Would I be in favor of that? Yes. It would get some more stupefied drinking people off the road. 
I don't really like. Uh, I live next door to the Cove. I don't really like it when people come. I think it's called the Cove. I don't really like it when people come out of there singing, you know, off key. So I would like there to be fewer people in the Cove. I let like the Cove go out of business, actually. And probably the way to do that is for me to raise the drinking age. Now I like wine, okay. So I don't really want to vote to raise the drinking age past where I am, but offered a choice to raise the drinking age from 21 to 22. Libertarian in me aside, I'm all in favor. People like me will vote to raise to 22. And then we'll vote to raise to 23. And you know what? The 18-year-olds, once they can't drink, actually also want to vote to raise the drinking age from 21 to 22. They're torn. On the one hand, they want it to be lower because they're going to get there. On the other hand, they want it to be higher because the higher it is, the more the 21-year-olds will be willing to hang around them because after all, right now, they don't want to hang around them because, oh, you can't drink. You're like tainted. You're horrible. So I'm not sure where the 18-year-olds are. But I know that the older people want to vote. So as you get ages moving, you can imagine a slippery slope where it moves and moves. By the way, we don't want it to go all the way to 100, because if, if none of us can drink, we might need some drunk people out there to make fun of. Imagine driving ages. You know, I definitely want the driving age to go up, 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 up. That's a good example. Minimum age legislation. Uh, I don't want it to go so far up that there aren't bus drivers. You know, I guess I would like to drive and maybe have four or five other people to drive, like my friends to come over to my house. But I, I would absolutely like none of you to be able to drive. I mean, you're making the roads much more dangerous. Even though you're probably a better driver than I am, you're making the roads much, much worse. And besides, you're not even buying American cars. So like, I have no, I have no use for you. I want a denser, you know, European-style center city. And you can imagine it. You know, again, it's kind of puzzling why the driving age is as low as we have. Unless you go back to this power politics, my opening point. Right, don't think of it that way. Think of it as interest groups that are against each other. There are a lot of interest groups that want the driving age to be younger. There are only a couple of interest groups that want the driving age to be older. The driving age is really pretty young. And there's not, no one says slippery slope uh, when it moves. Something we'll come back to. All right, try a completely different example. Let's try a politically incorrect one, uh, disability accommodations. I think the rest of my examples are all politically incorrect, except maybe a carbon tax. That's like the correct one. Try disability accommodations. So once upon a time, there were no ramps. It was a free market. And there were people in wheelchairs. And then there were a few buildings and restaurants that might have put ramps in. I mean, they might have decided, oh, it's not a bad market. We could get all wheelchair-bound diners to come to us. And there were some ramps in 1960. I mean, that's true. Then law got into the action. Interest groups get into the action. And there, there was a big veterans group that was in favor of requiring ramps. And there was the predecessor of the modern Americans, for, Americans with Disabilities, a very, very large organization now. By the way, Veterans with Disabilities is now the second largest disability interest group, if that's what you want to call it. So there were interest groups that started lobbying, and they're in favor of requiring ramps. Where do they start? They can say there should be ramps on every structure, because they know that's going to lose, right? Most homeowners don't want a requirement that if you renovate your house, or you, even on an existing house, that you have to put a ramp in. It's also probably not cost justified, but again, I'm not that into the cost efficiency of it right now because I don't know what the interest groups really care. MAD is not doing studies about drinking. They just know they don't want people drinking. All right, well, what happens with disabilities is they go pick on the largest buildings. Yeah, just what you think. They go say, well, you know, the Sears Tower should have a ramp. It happens that they're also picking on the places where it's most cost justified, right? thousands and thousands of people working there, a ramp is pretty much a fixed cost for each building. So that's a pretty good idea to put a ramp where the most people might benefit from it. Maybe in the same time, they might even go after government buildings or shopping malls. So that, you know, it's like a non-market market solution, and there's a lot of lobbying. The big office building owners, they don't like this. This is a big fixed cost. If they'd want to put the ramp in, they would have put it in on their own. And they go to other landlords, and they say, this is horrible. This is anti-free free America. Help me lobby against the requirement of ramps. And the mid-sized guys have a tough calculation here, something I'm going to have to save time and do all in one shot. But you can imagine they're thinking, well, if they're going to come after me next, then maybe I want to defend now. But if they're only going to require ramps on the Sears Tower, that's really great for me, because there'll be fewer Sears Towers in the world in the long run. And it'll be cheaper to be me. Maybe the Sears Tower will go out of business. Maybe that shopping mall won't be created. Only small shopping malls will survive. That's a really good idea. Oh, you should put a lot of requirements on big shopping malls. Make them have smoke alarms and ramps. And every store, you know, all these stores have these cool little steps to go down to different shopping areas. They should all be required to have ramps. 
And there are states that did that. That's really great if you're the strip mall guy. Try to price the big mall out of uh, the market. So let's say it passes. And step one is that the largest buildings are required to have ramps. Now in step two, the advocates are still going for it. They want ramps everywhere. Again, they're not cost-benefit guys. They want ramps where their wheelchairs go. And now they go after the secondary buildings, you might say. Still sort of knowing they'll probably never get the individual homeowners, because there are a lot of votes there. But now what happens at the time of the secondary guys, now here's the big step in the talk, so pay attention here. Now the secondary guys go to the first guys and say, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. They're coming after us now to put ramps on every building of more than five stories. Help us. And the first guys say, no, we don't want to help you. First of all, there's nothing in it for us. Our ramps are in already. Second of all, it's bad for us when you're, when you're not required to have ramps, right? That makes for an unlevel playing field because in the long run, it's more expensive for large office buildings to exist than for medium-sized ones. You have this cost advantage. So I want you to have the same cost disadvantage that I have. And therefore, if anything, in some of these cases, the largest office buildings were leaders of the movement to require the medium office buildings to have ramps. Right? Everybody see the idea? Right. So you should think of this as a version of a divide and conquer strategy, that advocates are better off not looking to put ramps on all office buildings, but first go after the biggest buildings, and then, with the help of the big buildings guy, go after the mid-sized building guys, and then continue down the slope, if you want to think of this as a slippery slope, Probably not all the way to individual homes. They might not get that far, but pretty far. And the major turning point here of the talk, and from this everything will follow, is you know, we don't know what the optimal amount of ramps is. That's a very, very hard question for reasons discussed earlier about driving and drinking and things like that. It's a very hard calculation. But whatever it is, it's quite plausible, given the organization of the advocates and the disorganization of the various sized buildings and malls, it's quite plausible that we overshoot the optimum, that we go further down the slope, again, because of the divide and conquer strategy. Step one, I go after them. Step two, I go after them. Step three, I go after them. And each step, the previously regulated people are happy to go after the next person. Okay? Let's try another example. No smoking. Once upon a time, you could smoke wherever you wanted. Then someone has this idea. Again, it's very interest group oriented industry. Someone has the idea, let's try to bar smoking in restaurants. Let's go after restaurants first. Fact of the matter is, the bar owners loved it. You're going to ban smoking in restaurants and allow smoking in bars? This is fantastic. Because, the smoke, again, if we had wanted to ban smoking on our own, we could have. But we didn't want to do it on our own. We thought there's more business in having smokers than in not having smokers, with rare exception. And now, if you bar smoking in restaurants, that's going to push more and more people who, want, who have at least one smoker in their group to congregate in bars. So it's good for the bar owners if the restaurant owners are regulated into no smoking. Sure enough, after restaurant owners are regulated and they become no smoking zones, sure enough, in locale after locale, the second step, the movement is to extend it from restaurants to bars, then from bars to hotels, then from hotels to office buildings, then from office buildings to public parks in some places. And now in five or six American jurisdictions to the entire uh, jurisdiction. Anywhere outdoors, outside of your own home or your friend's house. Step-by-step -step legislation. Now, when we grow up or when we go to law school, we're often told, oh, incrementalism is the way to go. You know, move in moderation, your parents always said to you. In law school, you have famous people, you know, Cass Sunstein saying, oh, judicial minimalism. You should always go one step at a time. Don't make a big change. You have unintended consequences. You know, it's like a search theory. You know, try to move step by step by step. Well, here's an important way in which incrementalism is a really bad idea. You know, if only we had known at step zero, tell us what you think the optimal amount of smoking or drinking or whatever is. Tell us where it is, and then let's have a fair fight about whether we want to go there or not. That might have worked. That might have been the optimistic story of drinking ages. But when we go step by step, when we follow our parents' advice and we go incrementally, we then find that what it really is is a ganging up strategy. As soon as you regulate the first people, they love, those restaurant owners love turning on the bars and regulating them. And then they love turning on the hotels and regulating them. And it's more about this military operation than it is about finding a social optimum or pitting interest groups against one another. Now, are those two examples the same? No. Notice that in the smoking example, 
it's not so bad at step two or three. If you come to the hotels and you say, now it's time to regulate you guys, and the restaurant owners and the bar owners are jumping up and down, yeah, yeah, regulate them. It's not fair, it's an unlevel playing field. The hotel owners could say to the restaurant and bar guys, to groups one and two, you know, if you would join with us now in stopping this smoking ban, we could have smoking in hotels for people who want. Maybe we on our own will do it floor by floor. And they say, yeah, but what's in it for me? Oh, I'll tell you what's in it for me. I promise that if you help me prevent the ban from moving to hotels, I'll roll back the rules for restaurants, or I'll roll back the rule for restaurants and bars. So I can promise you a reversal as part of the package. Now there's questions here about commitment to the promise and how you can enforce it, and maybe we'll get to that in questions and answers. But you see the general idea that in the smoking case, there is this problem of incrementalism, what I'll call the problem of incrementalism. There's the problem of dividing and conquering. But it's not a complete problem because at any step, I mean, there's a loss. I lost patrons in step one and two. But at least in step three, when everybody can see, oh, they were dividing and conquering us now, I can go back and form an alliance. It's kind of the optimal alliance that I wish had been formed in step one. I can always form it in step three and try to roll back the rules that happened in step one and two. Not so easy to roll back the rules in ramps. Right? In the RAM case, you see why I picked that example. In RAM case, when I say, oh, I'll roll back the rules and they no longer require ramps. The CS Tower guy says, you know, what good does that do me? The ramp was a fixed investment. It cost a little bit to maintain, but basically I've spent a million dollars putting the ramp in already. It's an irreversibility problem. Smoking is not irreversible. We can change the law. The ramp is irreversible. So whatever this problem of incrementalism, it's greater. The step-by-step -step more dangerously overshoots or undershoots the social optimum it's greater the more there are irreversible investments, irreversible investments because of regulation in the earlier steps. The problem is still there for smoking, but a couple of asides before I move to other punchlines. You know, uh, sometimes it's said, well, the great thing about step by step is that you learn a lot. You know, the real reason for incrementalism is learning, and yeah, I love more, you got this problem with incrementalism, but it's surely overcome by how much you learn. The reason we go step by step is that we learn from our mistakes or from our successes in the past. That's why you should go step by step. You know, um, it's there. I, I, just, I think it's hogwash, uh, but it's there. It, it seems completely ridiculous to me. First of all, it never seems to work. You pick passionate people who believe in no smoking, I'll just pick that example, and passionate people who are libertarian and think you should smoke wherever the heck you please, and then you run a little experiment and you say, oh, well, now we're going to try no smoking, in restaurants, you'll see that everybody feels better and that convention business still comes to Chicago. It never proves anything. You have that experiment for a year, and then one side says, oh, look what happened. Uh, actually, there was a fall off in revenues. And then the other side said, well, that's because people move from the restaurants to smoke outdoors. We have to ban it outdoors also. And the other side says, no, no, the reason it went down is because convention business didn't come because there was a recession. You know, it's very, very hard to run these experiments. If you believe passionately in something, uh, I would say this about capital punishment, gun control, abortion, but certainly about trivial things like smoking and disability comedy, you know, trivial meaning people don't usually kill each other over them, but they're issues. It's very hard to find somebody who's passionate about something, that is these advocacy groups on the two sides. It's really hard to find that person who's ever moved by empirical evidence from a step-by-step -step experiment. They can always come up with, just look at us, they're all stuck in our ways, because empirical evidence means nothing to us. Now, you know I mean that facetiously. Impressive empirical evidence means a lot to us. But impressive political evidence, usually impressive empirical evidence, usually comes not from incrementalism, but usually comes from dramatic experiments. <clears throat> Try an experiment like, let's have five years of no smoking in Milwaukee. No smoking anywhere. And then let's compare hospitalization rates in Milwaukee with Green Bay. Similar weather, similar this, similar that. That would be a very, very interesting experiment. It's the opposite of incremental. It's not, oh, the bars, the restaurants, when the two steps, you need a ramp. You know, let's try ramps. Let's see what happens to employment when the tallest buildings have ramps. Well, if it doesn't work, they'll just say, well, that's because you couldn't get to the buildings. You've got to have ramps on the buses, too. You need more taxes. You, need, you, know, you almost need a dramatic experiment to prove to the disbeliever that a change in the legal system uh, would have worked. So I, I don't want to belabor that. I'll just say I'm really not impressed with learning from incrementalism. And indeed, I think uh, there's no necessary association with step-by-step -step regulation and learning. If anything, it's usually uh, the other way uh, around. 
Now, here's another big step. How about this solution to the ramp case? I want you to help me keep ramps out of my strip mall. So I go back to the big and the middle-sized office buildings and the big shopping malls, and I say, you guys got to help me. And they say, no, oh, didn't you go to that CBI? I mean, we don't want to help you. We, we, we want to gang up on you. We want to pile on so that there'll be a level playing field. We're hoping you'll be regulated just like we've been regulated. And I'll say, oh, come on, I'll try to roll back the regulation. Again, they say, Don't, didn't you listen? It doesn't do any good because we've already got the ramp. It's a million dollar fixed cost. And I'll say, OK, I have a plan. Under my plan, we will make sure that I'm not regulated, no ramps required in mid-sized shopping malls, in strip malls. And we will go back retroactively and compensate you for the ramp that we, put in, we required you to put in. It's like we will admit that our regulation was a bad thing in this version. And we'll compensate you for putting in the ramp. Notice, by the way, that if we compensated people for putting in ramps at step one, imagine you had a rule. Every government regulation, compensation. And imagine for this whole conversation that all compensation is perfectly calculated. Well, in that case, nobody would ever mind regulation. Nobody would lobby about it, except for third party effects. You want to regulate me? You know, fine. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do to me, I'll collect an equivalent amount of money. It'll be fine. But as I think you know already in law school, or if not, a moment will convince you, it's really hard to have a baseline there. What does it mean to regulate you? Regulate you compared to what? And what's the real loss from having the ramp? It's very, very hard to calculate that. But in any event, that's not our world. So in a world where we're not prepared to compensate people for every single regulation we pass, regulation is sort of discretionary. It's like we have to decide in some statutes to compensate people. And my promise could be, help me defeat ramps for mid-sized strip malls, and I'll go back and compensate you for having put the ramps in the Sears Tower in the first place. That way, we'll now form what I called before the perfect alliance. Now we will have a coalition that wants to do all the people who might be subject to ramps. We'll now get together and battle the disabilities advocates. And we don't know where they'll come out. But again, given my starting point, it'll be the magic power politics equilibrium that we must think is right in our democratic system, or we wouldn't have this system in the first place. So in theory, compensation could offset the reversibility and could offset the divide and conquer. It's not, not bad, actually. There's a small, I'd feel better if you were smiling or nodding your head vigorously or, or something. Uh, there's some problems with it. I mean, a small problem is that you might not be reliable. I mean, you own the Sears Tower, and I say in my bill that I want you to support and lobby for, I will be unregulated, and we can't deregulate you anymore. You've got your ramp, but we'll give you a million dollars for that ramp you built three years ago. You know, the problem is once we agree to that, it's very hard for me to monitor you that you're really working hard lobbying with me. After all, if it passes, you could free ride and get your million dollars anyway. So it might be a little bit hard to monitor. You could think of it as a kind of moral hazard that once you're promised compensation, you actually won't work anymore for the result you want. But even if we could overcome that, there's a much, much bigger problem, which is the problem of rent seeking. For those of you that haven't met this concept, it's, it's the following idea. Go, go back pre-Sears Tower regulation. Rumor has it that the legislature is thinking of requiring ramps. Sears Tower thinks, oh, no, it's a million dollar loss to us. Again, that's net of new business or whatever. Well, how much will the Sears Tower spend to lobby the legislature to try to keep that ramp legislation out? They'll hire lobbyists and like. It's a very hard question, which we don't need to answer today. But the answer is a lot. Maybe, in theory, up to a million dollars. You could come up with an answer that was way more than a million dollars, too, on sunk cost grounds, or way less. But just imagine that to prevent a million dollar loss, let's just do the logical, intuitive answer. The Sears Tower owner will spend you know, $950,000, if necessary, in order to prevent the million dollar loss. You could think of that as that's called rent seeking, in the sense that they might spend this money in a completely wasteful way. A bribe wouldn't be wasteful. This is Chicago, after all. We just call that a wealth transfer. We're not worried about that. <laughs> but, but they might spend it on advertising campaigns that nobody wants to see. They might spend it on um, three martini lunches, if they exist anymore, that nobody really wants to eat and drink. So there's a lot of this waste goes into rent seeking of people spending a lot of money to try to keep law from happening. Notice how terrible the compensation rule is then. Once upon a time, the ramp threat caused a $950,000 rent seeking loss. That aside from the ramps, they spent a lot of money to prevent ramps. Now with compensation, they'll spend twice that. First, they'll spend up to $950,000 to try to keep ramps from getting enacted in the first place. Then if they lose, they swallow the 950. Three years later, I come and I say, join me and we'll get you compensated. Now you'll spend another $950,000 to try to get the million dollar compensation. 
So discretionary compensation is a very, very dangerous thing in an interest group society because it doubles the amount of rent seeking. Everybody see that? You know, at first you lobby, you rent seek, you lobby, you try to spend money to prevent laws you don't like or to get subsidies you do like or whatever. And then if later on there's the possibility of being compensated for losing, you again will spend that amount of money, maybe waste that amount of money trying to get your result. So although compensation is a clever way to try to overcome irreversibility, I think it almost surely does more harm than good because it'll double the amount of rent seeking and it's hard to believe that we really uh, want that. It's cool, by the way, if you think this is all theoretical, it's cool that we never see reversals, almost never see reversals of safety legislation. Let's just take motorcycle, well, uh, let me say it the other way. We never see compensation for reversals of safety legislation. So there are examples of where there is safety legislation that's required, and then later on we decide, you know, that actually wasn't very good safety legislation, or it's technologically leapfrogged by something else, and then we rescind the safety regulation. You know, you have to wear helmets, you don't have to wear them anymore. Uh, but I cannot find a single example, hopefully somebody knows one, I don't think there's a single example of where after we say you can wear a helmet again, that we say, oh, and we feel bad for this mistake we made, and we'll compensate you that you had to wear the helmet or buy the helmet. And to me, that's kind of a nice positive clue that we sense that there's a bad thing with offering such compensation. And my little subclaim today is that the bad thing is that it just increases rent seeking even more. First, people rent seek for the primary activity, and then they would rent seek to try to get compensated if it's ever uh, reversed. Uh, there's a possible solution uh, to all this. I, I don't like the solution much. I like the problem better. Uh, there are a lot of possible solutions, but one that I just raised today might be forcing people at step one to say what they were really after. So you can imagine something like, you tell us at step one how much no smoking you want. So you think the right thing is no smoking in public places? Okay, list them. Bars, restaurants, hotels, indoor public places, shopping malls, you know, go list them all. And then the rule will be that if it passes, uh, the general legal understanding will be that you promise, in a way, it'll be a misdemeanor, if you will, to lobby for more uh, in the future. That is, for, say, five years. You know, you would agree, let's have one big coalition formation, and then a sort of social, somewhat legal agreement. It would be politically unpopular to try to change the rule for five years. Think of gun registration. That might be an easy place to see this. You know, we want to outlaw uh, AK-47s. Oh, yeah, you're doing that. The next thing you know, a guy won't be able to defend his house. Knives will be prohibited. Say, no, no, here's our rule. We're going to list exactly what's to be outlawed. Small handguns, define a Saturday night specials in the following way, AK-47s, nuclear weapons, uh, <laughs> phantom fighters. We're going to list the things that you can't own. And then we're committing that for five years, we will not try to expand that list or add to the onus of gun ownership. There won't be further registration requirements or anything. You can imagine some equilibrium like that taking some hold. Again, not quite enforceable, very hard to have pre-commitments in politics, but a solid kind of claim of this is what we want up front because we're trying not to step by step you to death, uh, if you will. It's possible that something like that uh, will work, that there'd be a big political price to pay uh, if it's violated. But you get the general idea, and here I'm going to stop with just a couple words of summary. The key thing I wanted to get across was that uh, we inherit a world in which incrementalism is glorified, moving step by step. And my claim today is um, I don't like incrementalism so much. It's got a big problem with it. And the problem is that it leads to this divide and conquer strategy in some settings. And then we get somewhere that's completely unlikely to be the social optimum. In all my examples, we overshoot at the social optimum. I could turn them all around to undershoot it. All I mean is we're unlikely to get there. Now, that does require a belief that if interest groups were not at stake, like my drunk driving, or driving in general, or drinking in general claim, that it does require some belief that a democracy is likely to get its drinking age right, hence the starting point and the title of the talk. But if you're optimistic and you think we got drinking ages right, then my claim is we're unlikely to get, this, we're unlikely to get smoking bans right. And we're really unlikely to get disability ramps right. Because those have a divide, they have all the problems the drinking age thing had, and they have the added problem of this divide and conquer, interest groups ganging up on one another problem. The bigger the problem, the more irreversibility. Compensation might be one solution, but I tried to show that that doubles the problem of rent seeking, and that's probably not somewhere we want to go. And maybe the next best thing is 
you know, some kind of disclose and delimit policy that I just sketched sloppily uh, at the end. Again, I'm not claiming that this incrementalism thing is true everywhere. There are many cases like drinking. You know, uh, abortion strikes me as an example like drinking, by which I mean they're not obvious interest groups to be divided and conquered against one another. Right? It's not obvious that, oh, this group really doesn't want that constraint on abortion. That group doesn't want a different constraint on abortion. We can turn one against the other. No, that seems to be very different, where people are on a different kind of slope, if you will, about how they feel about abortion. But other topics are very much in here. Take employment discrimination, for a final example. You pass something like Title VII or some employment discri anti-discrimination act, and it often begins by saying this applies only to discrimination on the basis of race and only to employers with more than 100 employees. That's really a typical way these statutes start. Well, why? Because it's a common divide and conquer. If the real goal is to apply to every employer or to apply to race, ethnic origin, gender, sexual orientation, many other things, let's have that up front. Let's have the, all the classes up front, and let's have all the employers up front, maybe five employees or more, or wherever the statute is eventually going. Instead, slowly but surely, we add classes, and slowly but surely, we add size of employers. Now, notice where my argument is. For adding classes, in my thing, that's fine. That's not an incrementalism problem. Because it's not as if, with very rare exception, it's not as if there are employers that specialize in discriminating on the basis of ethnic origin. You know, basically all employers are in this together with all employees, and it's not like you're dividing and conquering groups very much by saying, ooh, let's first get race, then we'll sneak in ethnic orientation. Oh, the race will gang up on the ethnics, it'll be great. That, that doesn't sound right. But on employer size, that sounds exactly right. Once the 100 employee firms are regulated, you bet they want the 50, for, the 50 person firms to be regulated. And that's exactly what happens. And then the statute moves down. So it gets started by saying to the Chamber of Commerce, oh, don't worry, don't worry. You're small members. They won't be regulated at all. It's only going to apply to General Motors. Oh, they don't have 100 employees anymore. Well, it's only going to apply to, it's only going to, apply to Microsoft. And then everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. But sure enough, it goes down and down and down and down until it includes seven employees. So I think the problem is there, but not there. So your turn. <coughs> Questions? Comments? Please. Um, the examples of the... Just a little louder. Oh, sorry. For, um, uh, I had the ramps everywhere, and having those clipping anywhere. Those examples are both good, because then you can see how the interest groups are divided and conquered. Um, and for this, this might be a little simplistic, but they also both threaten a situation where the outcome we've got to are both pretty wonderful. I wonder if you could just give some little service to the idea that we overshot the social... Um, so this is a typical uh, Chicago question, I think. It starts off with kind of a faux compliment. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> here, are these examples that, here are these examples that really go, I hate you. you know? um, <laughs> and so the question, in case you couldn't hear it, was, but uh, gee, you're, you're telling us there's a problem with incrementalism, but you seem purposely to be picking examples that ended up where probably 90% of the people in the room would vote and say, oh, I kind of like the social equilibrium, the political equilibrium we've reached. So why didn't you pick examples that end up in really strange places in order to show us the problem, right? Uh, I, I bought just little gifts for people with questions. Um, and, and that strikes me as an OK question. So you get an OK gift. <laughs> the ever so valuable University of Chicago Law School hat. Maybe you could help send it back there somewhere. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for speaking up. <clears throat> ah, you see, it's this experiment. I'm always interested whether the person puts on the hat right away. OK, if I'd given you a book, would you start reading it right away? Or? All right, um, well, that's why I picked those examples. I mean, again, I do want to show that I think compensation and reversibility play some role. I would like it better if you thought that the smoking equilibrium we reach was closer to the polit power politics optimum than the ramp. That would be great for me. If you thought they were both OK, but smoking probably worked better. Because then I could show you, oh, you see, the irreversibility problem was really a big problem. Uh, I guess I think that studies show uh, that the ramp legislation is ridiculously inefficient. I'll say it just to be politically incorrect. Uh, ridiculously inefficient in the sense that uh, ramps are not required in some places where they would do an enormous amount of social good. They're buildings with you know, 100 stories. And then you go inside, and then two steps down, and there's no ramp. And it seems completely crazy. And then there are other places you know, where you need things at every level. Uh, you know, the Green Lounge is maybe one such example, where it seems you know, 
huge overinvestment compared to all the other good things you could do with money, even for people with the very same disabilities. So I guess I think uh, you know, that when you look at disability uh, law, actually it way overshoots in some investments and way undershoots in others. Uh, I'm happy to say that I think it's really inefficient legislation. Now, again, it's not really what I want to say, right, if I was giving a long answer, because I don't want to say that I think the drinking age is efficient. I want to say that the drinking age is, I don't know what efficient is, so I'm an optimistic democratic guy who hopes that power politics leads us to a sort of efficient equilibrium. That's, again, what I want to say about the ramps, that I just don't see that as an equilibrium that the groups, you know, if you brought in the most advocates for universal ramping, and you brought in the people most, and you brought in Richard Epstein, or somebody totally opposed to government intervention, uh, I don't think that either of them, if they had to rank priorities, would rank them the way law is. You know, it doesn't strike me as an equilibrium that they would, that they would want. So uh, I guess that's, that's my answer. Then I, I, I'm not embarrassed about those examples. I don't think they've reached equilibrium. And I do think the ramps are worse than the smoking. So instead of the compensation sort of example you laid out, why wouldn't you just say that it would be better to say that you can't amend any regulations or legislation for some period of time after you've enacted them? So, for example, you didn't, I imagine the obvious problem would be that you would have a lot of rent seeking up front so that groups would be, you know, there's some over and under inclusive line. So with smoking, for example. That's what I want, right? I want a big political bargain up front. Right. Okay. The idea would be that you couldn't, you know, once we pass the this regulation, we're stuck with it, no matter what, for five, ten years, something like that. And so like you said, obviously, you spend So you, this has nothing to do with compensation, right? No, the idea is that you spend all the money up front instead oh, of Oh, let's leave compensation out. It's not about compensating for change. Right, no, you never. Well, isn't that what I finished with? I thought my, dis my disclose and delimit idea was, show us where you're going, and either let's vote on that now, or tell us where you want to be in five years, and then you can't go past that. But I think that in actual After all, your, yours is a little, it's unnecessarily constraining if you're optimistic. It might be that they will. We want ramps everywhere with three stories or more. But actually, we don't want to vote on that right now. We, we are going to do that. I'm disclosing to everybody, don't vote for this if you don't like ramps, because we're going to go all the way to three stories or more. We want to start with the Sears Tower, because we actually believe in some learning. We think that maybe by requiring ramps now, we will learn over time what the optimal width of the ramp is or how to do buses that move to ramps. So we don't have to put it all in legislation now, but we are telling you that that's where we're going. That, that was why I didn't quite do your plan, but just did a, disclose where you want to go. <laughs> Show us your big legislation, and you can't go beyond that for five years. That's sort of the same idea as yours. Yeah, no, I'm saying go ahead and go. If you want to go to three, then let's go to three and be done. Well, we, OK, you don't want to leave any room for learning. No, that's OK with me. I, I, I don't see what I gain by that. I think you gain a little bit this way. Again, it's kind of sloppy, right? Well, I guess I'm just thinking that every year that you redo the regulation, you're having continual rent seeking in interest groups and stuff. So if yeah. you put all that up front, you, know, you would think you would expend less money overall than uh -huh. But all the better if I'm willing to say I'm going to three stories, but I'm starting with 100. All the better that it shows I'm willing to undertake these political battles every few years, even though I'm telling you where it is. That doesn't seem so bad, actually. But, but I hear what you're saying. I don't know. Does it deserve a gift? What, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that you followed up. So uh, we'll even, let's, let's do this. We can go with a book. <laughs> Would you have asked the question if not for the gift? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, then give it back. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So you say disclose where you want to go. Um, I think it's the weakest part of the talk. I know. Right. But maybe okay. one, maybe your example sort of proved that. I don't think people always know where they want to go, and because social norms change, and so right. we used to think smoking was no big deal, and then you know, all of a sudden we thought smoking was a big deal, and you know, likewise we didn't think that you needed disability accommodations, and then we did. So how do you know, you know upfront what you're going to want in five years or ten years? You know, is the real problem that people you know, people's desires change, and so you're always going to have the problem of incrementalism because. People you know, just want more as time goes on. They never want yeah. less. They always want more. Does anyone need a question repeated? I mean, you want a facetious answer or a non-facetious? I mean, the facetious answer is it's all in the eyes of whether you think there's this incrementalism problem. If I said to you, a country, you know, call it Hitler or whatever you want, you know, they went and invaded Poland, and you know. You shouldn't really say that their plan was to invade all of Europe. You know, they didn't really know their future preferences. 
they just went after one and they hoped to get it. And they, you know, you would just say that was ridiculous. So a lot of it just depends on whether you think there is a divide and conquer strategy at stake. And you're right, now to be unfacetious, I don't know whether this is a self-conscious divide and conquer strategy. I'm enough of a positivist that in a way I don't care. I care more about that the victims, they're not victims, that the victims don't know when to defend. I, I want to make sure you understand that all these arguments can be turned around. It might be we're undershooting the social optimum because the advocates are really badly organized. It's a bunch of disabled people that have no way of getting together and Sears Tower is part of a strong group of landlords. I, I'm, I'm really symmetrical about this. In that case, I think it's all reversed. We're going to way undershoot because we're not giving the disabled people one chance to get together in a bargain. We're making them spend money year after year. It's you know, meant to be a symmetrical argument. Just in those cases, it looks like the, you know, and, and maybe there's, you know, the advocates of the action rather than inaction. I mean, it might be a little more likely to overshoot in some cases, but I'm happy for it to go either way. So, I mean, that, the facetious answer, I think, is revealing, which is, I guess it just depends on how likely you think divide and conquer strategies. Sure, the reason I pick five years rather than 20 is that norms and preferences change. I mean, that is the problem. And you can always explain why you went further later on by saying, I learned from it, or it changed, or I found out that smoke, secondhand smoke was awful, or not awful, or whatever it is. You know, the more you think that's true, the more you would never like any limit on future things. You know, I think in reality, you should be comfortable with the solution. The one I called sloppy, you should like, because after all, it's only a political commitment. I promise for five years, I won't raise taxes, and I won't extend regulation beyond hotels. And then war breaks out. And I'm the politician, and I say, I'm sorry, I know I promised no taxes for five years, but we've got to raise taxes to fight to defend the homeland. And you know, we suspect that it'll go over well you know, on left and right wing radio. Because people will say, well, when he said no taxes, he meant in the normal course of events, and this enemy landing on our shores obviously changes the circumstances. Presumably the same thing would be true of smoking. If unbelievable new evidence came out that smoking was good for you, or that smoking in your closed single family house was the worst thing for national health care ever, people would presumably be forgiving about my breaking the promise of limiting change. So I don't know that I'm that worried about it if there's dr remarkable new evidence. But um, you know, I think the, the wimpier answer is just to say, I don't think you're allowed to make your move because then your move is about all commitments. You know, we should never have a constitutional protection. Equal protection, terrible idea. First Amendment, terrible idea. I mean, after all, we might really learn new information and change our preferences about how good speech is. You know, we are accustomed to a democratic system where the way you operate is by thinking really hard about something, coming up with a plan, and trying to put it into effect that will survive simple majority change of the preferences. We do that all the time. And so I don't think I have to be embarrassed to join it. But I, but I appreciate the question. It's definitely worth a hack. Yeah, please. Um, do you think advocating against incrementalism is taking a stance against changing things then? Because it makes it very difficult to make any sort of changes when you don't have that sort of slow tool. Wow, you've never met anyone who likes change as much as I do. So it can't be that. Uh, no, I think it's uh, in favor of straight talk. It says, uh, don't hide incrementalism from us. You should show us up front where your step-by-step -step movements are going. You want to turn off the wireless in the classroom, but your real plan is to ban cell phones from the whole law school? Then when you ban the wireless, you should say, my real plan is to get all TVs and phones and computers out of the law school, but I think it would be really unpopular if I did it right away, and so I'm going step-by-step. -step. That's what I'm in favor of. And therefore, if I don't say that, it means, no, I think phones are great, and all I want to do is ban wireless. I think Incrementalism is very, very valuable for a lot of reasons. People can adjust, investment expectations can adjust. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to do that. And by the way, I'm also a big fan of retroactivity, that I might hold people responsible for not figuring out where my change was going a long time ago, though that seems like an unrelated topic. So it's not about change, the opposite. I love a legal system that gives people every incentive to answer Nick's question, to figure out where his preferences will be in three years. I like that. Do you think as a practical matter, though, it would limit that? Or would it help you find the optimal change? Or I, I, all, I, all I can do is retreat to drinking age. What's the right drinking age? Me. Whatever drinking age we have. I, if that's our democracy, I have some faith that I cannot answer that question with fancy cost-benefit calculations, although people are entitled to do the calculations in order to try to induce the voters or the legislature to change the age. But derivatively, 
it's got to be a function of these well-matched interest groups battling each other. If you don't believe that, then you should be opposed to every law we have, because those are the laws we have. It's the result of political squabbling and hopefully well-matched interest groups. The times to be skeptical about law is when you think the interest groups are poorly matched. There's a bunch of dispersed people on one side and a well-organized group on the other side. That gets me nervous. But in this case, as long as they're well-matched groups, I'm fine. So my only problem is we could have our well-matched groups, but the problem is this divide and conquer strategy in either direction. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm not against all change. I'm not even against all small change. I like small change in abortion, for example. It seems to me exactly the way a society should go. I like small change in minimum age legislation. It's fine, because I don't see the divide and conquer strategy there. I don't like small, I'm worried about small change where it appears that the interest groups or the cohorts are constructed, that it's divide and conquer. So I'm, I'm going to say that again, because I guess it didn't come across. It's not a claim that all incrementalism is problematic. There are settings like the drinking age, like voting ages, like abortion, like employment by race, then gender, then whatever, where I think incrementalism is fantastic. You have nothing to lose. You have a lot to gain. It's great. There doesn't seem to be any dividing and conquering. It's a terrific way to go. I'm opposed to it when it looks opposed, meaning it gets me nervous. It's problematic when it looks like it's being done in a way to get the Sears Tower guys to gang up on the mall. That's what I think should bother. OK? Having not had a seat, you got to ask. Uh, I'm going to take some of the assumptions out of my question, but and just ask you, how can this framework be used to uh, sort, of, sort of look at the current healthcare debate, where it's from the, from the single payer plan to public adoption to any other small little change that we might have? Yeah, you know, healthcare uh, strike, first of all, you notice they seem to be aiming for one big coalition at one time. So it doesn't seem to be suffering from an incrementalism problem. It's a big enough issue that surely it will look a little incrementalist when we're done. Imagine we get a huge healthcare reform package that passes. No doubt a year later, all these interest groups will come and be chipping at the margins. Oh, the payback for that thing should be a little higher. Oh, the tax on people with more than a million dollars shouldn't be 5.4%, but should be 6.1%. You know, there'll be a lot of those things. And then we'll have to decide whether we think that those are divide and conquer situations. I, I don't know. No, in other words, I don't know. It's, it, that seems such a big topic that, um, you know, everyone knows to be in the battle up front. It's a fair political fight, if you will, up front. It, it may not be fair in the sense that all the people who are interested want more money into health care and taxpayers might be too dispersed. I mean, that may be a problem. But it looks like a typical political battle. It is true, then, that there'll be other little topics down the road that just chip at things all the time, and those will suffer from incrementalism problems. I, I don't really know what to do about that. I can't solve all the world's problems there. You know? So I guess my answer is, it's too big a topic, there's enough attention paid to it, therefore I think incrementalism piece is just a very small part of whatever you think wrong or what's the problem. I'm just wondering if you assume that the end game isn't the single payer, really actually more socialist kind but of But that's game. not an end game either. It's single payer covering what? There'll always be incremental questions to ask. Will be single payer where you're allowed to go to Detroit and get laser surgery or not? Well, you know, it's such a big topic. There'll always be these incrementalist things uh, at the margin. Uh, and, and no, I don't, I don't think that. I think, for example, say you thought you knew that single payer was the wrong way to go. Let's say you thought that. I, I don't know why you think that, by the way. But let's say you thought that. Uh, and now you've found a health care plan of the kind that's in the paper today, you know, take some average of the Senate and the House version. And then I said to you, do you think this, if it passed this package, is single payer more likely? Or if this package fails, is single payer more likely? I, I guess I think people would be evenly divided. It's not obvious to me why going halfway goes all the way. You know, it's sort of like saying if you bail out General Motors, do you think it's more or less likely that you bail out Delta Airlines later on? I don't know. It's some precedent for bailout. And it's some precedent for, oh my god, bailouts don't help. But, you know, I, I don't know. So I don't see those as incremental. I understand that with the advantage of hindsight, we might later on say this led to single payer or not. But I don't see it. We have time for at least two more. Uh, I wonder who finally decides which, which approach should be um, applied, whether, the, whether to play with open cards or um, to apply it as step-by-step. 
oh, these are the important rules of the game, but they're subtext rules. I think it's attitude. I think right now, the, I mean, the reason I'm interested in this topic is the attitude of the world is certainly that incrementalism is a good thing. That's basically the attitude. Short of some really extreme topics, you know, free speech or something like that. But in most cases, people don't think it's cool to be absolutist. And they think, you know, incremental is the way to go. And I'm just trying to raise a red flag and say, in some settings, incremental is not so good. There's no one gets to set the rules. It's just the next time around when someone suggests incremental change, you and you and maybe three other people might say, you know, I'd like to hear your opinion about whether you would extend the rule to hotels or not and why, and try to embarrass us into not extending it to hotels later on. And maybe, maybe that's a subtle move towards the disclose and delimit idea. But it's not like you can pass a meta rule that says that incrementalism is no longer allowed because you can't really define incrementalism. You know, it's very hard to define, except that it's a little more step by step than dramatic. You know, what I, in the actual paper I say, you know, one person's incrementalism is another person's drama. You know, I might think it's a really small step to raise the tax rate from 5.4 to 6.4. And you might think, that's the whole world, that's a huge change. You know, it's not like it can be so defined as to be legislative. Well, isn't that how the private market does it? You know, so here, here's another way to think about that. Let me give you another part of the talk that I admitted. Uh, where's this problem coming from? You know, why don't we say this is an information problem? Right? Isn't that one way to think about it? We get to bargain up front about ramps, and I want to know whether you're really going to require ramps in my strip mall. If you are, then I'm going to join the Sears Tower now and argue against ramps. So I want information about whether you, it's really you, an interest group, operating through the government as intermediary. But it's sort of like saying, I want to know whether you, the government, is really going to stop here or keep going. So I have this information problem. And you might say, well, we have these information problems all the time. You know, I say, sell me 10 widgets at, you know, $5 each. And you might say, OK, I, I, I changed my mind, because that guy's going to sell to me for $4 each. And then you say, well, you know, I might sell to you for $3.50, but I want to know how many widgets are you going to Are you going to become my biggest customer in the future? So I learned to say, by the way, make me really great widgets at a low price, and I really can help make you rich. I'm going to be huge widget guy. And, you know, we both are exaggerating and lying to each other all the time to try to, well, we have this information problem in private markets all the time, that you don't know whether something is the end game or something is step by step by step. And our usual solution to it is to say, well, short of absolute fraud, that's just the way the market works. And if you think I'm not good with information, you go to a competitor. And if I don't like your price, I go to So there's some competition that controls this market of that information so we don't have to have rules about incrementalism. And again, the problem with the government, you might say, is that the government's a monopoly. It's the only one that can impose ramps on you without paying you for it. And so we don't have the competition alternative. That's why we might need to care about these rules. But it really is an information problem that's quite familiar and that we don't, we're not usually able to define as what's the rule in a private market about being incremental. Uh, one more. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that one thing that's omitted from from the analysis is that. Um, Do you mind if I throw that out while you're talking, or it's rude? No, it's fine. Okay. Uh, it's, <coughs> oops, sorry. You sort of present it like if you go after the uh, if you go after a large group of people all at once, you know, maybe all the employers in your example, uh, you probably won't get it through because there's so much opposition. So you start you just. Go with uh, over 100. Every, where do I want to go? Down to the middle somewhere? And you want to go down to the middle, yeah. Your end game is 50, right. so you start with 100. But that omits that if you're uh, trying to work with an interest group that's very concentrated and really stands to be harmed, uh, they will probably lash back more aggressively against that policy. So doesn't that sort of offset that that tactical um, decision? In that you know if you're if you're just targeting if you target a small group that has a lot to lose. Uh, they're, they're the interest group that probably will really prevail. Okay, that, that's a great question, but I'm, I'm sorry, I have no more gifts. Oh, a bottle of water? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, <we're both> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so here's another version. Here's a version of the question that makes it totally helpful to me. Uh, meaning, let's turn it into a friendly add on rather than a question. You know, maybe the problem with incrementalism, it's not a matter of how far down the slippery slope you go. It's even a problem of where on the slippery slope do you grab. You know, it might be that the most effective ramps, let's just smoking, because it'll be real. It might be that the best health benefit from smoking 
would be uh, not to allow smoking in office buildings, in lobbies. That might have been the best first move for smoking. But boy, there are a lot of offices out there. So instead, they thought, well, who can we pick on? Oh, uh, everybody, you know, local restaurants, there's so many small locales with the restaurants, they're locally managed. They're going, those guys are completely disorganized anyway. They're always coming and going, going out of business. Let's start with restaurants. And it might be that the world would have stopped there. And then we would say, after, boy, you know the problem with incrementalism? It's not a matter of overshooting, undershooting. It's grabbing the wrong assets. Smoking turns out to be banned in restaurants rather than lobbies of buildings. Not because it's a better health thing over there. It's much worse. It's just because they went after the weakest group first. That is another version of the incrementalism problem. It's not just about magnitude. It's about the quality of regulation as well. That's essentially what I was trying to say about ramps in the law school and elsewhere. It doesn't seem to be lined up at all with efficiency. It seems to be lined up with, well, who do you have over the regulatory hurdle? You've got the people looking for building code changes. Nobody thinks in advance they're going to be renovated. You know, let's go after the renovation. You know, that's a whole complicated thing in order to get rules through, pushed by an advocacy group that essentially values the cost of putting these ramps at zero. You know, they don't care. They just want more ramps. In this example, I don't care. I just want less smoking. I don't care about your smoking provision. So uh, I think that's, that point is a very friendly one. It's right. I'm not claiming it's about quantity. It's even about where you go. In your example, if you were right, they wouldn't have gone after big office buildings in the first place. If those guys were really well organized, a small group that could oppose it, they wouldn't go there at all. They would start. Uh, they would have started somewhere else. It was, after all, banned in hospitals first. I mean, they didn't quite start there. There were other places. So uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all your questions, but feel free to let me know. Thank you.